Uh, my name is Abel Endasho, and I'm the program coordinator for the ANH Academy and the MANA program based at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, thank you very much for joining us uh, on this webinar today, co hosted by ANH Academy and GIZ about how to design effective SPC messages and materials. It is the fourth out of five in our webinar series on social and behavior change for improved agriculture and nutrition. And you can find all the previous webinars in our website. The Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Academy brings together researchers, practitioners, and policymakers working for better nutrition and health through improved agriculture and food system. With members over 100 countries, the NH Academy is a global network and platform for sharing research and evidence, capacity strengthening, and collaboration across diverse disciplines. Um, if you're not a member yet, we encourage you to join us and sign up for free. Um, I think that's it for me for now. Now over to you, um, Cecilia. Hello, everyone. My name is Cecilia Gonzalez, and I am one of the leaders of the Agriculture Nutrition Community of Practice, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, I'm going to, uh, today we have uh, three great speakers for this webinar. Uh, the first one is Peter Mitchell. He is the principal and chief creative officer at Marketing for Change company, and also a practitioner and thought leader in social and behavior change for more than two decades. Uh, he has worked for many foundations, nonprofits, corporations, and government agencies, and is also the winner of many awards in this area. Um, we'll also be hearing from Miraz Rahman. He's the head of collaboration, learning, and adaptation at Helen Keller International. Um, with the Sapling Project in Bangladesh, responsible for uh, creating the SBC materials and tools for improved nutrition and food security. And he oversees a collection and sharing of program innovations and lessons learned. And we're gonna hear examples of his work in Bangladesh uh, today. And uh, she will be with us, but not with us, but we'll have her voice uh, uh, throughout Amy Stormer. She, is, she provides strategic, programmatic, and M&E support to Helen Keller International's programs, uh, particularly in Asia and the Pacific region. Uh, also, she has a lot of experience in designing strategies and communications materials, and she will be with us via uh, voice. Uh, and then without any further ado, I'm going to stop sharing and um, pass the, the baton to Peter. Thanks so much. Um, so we'll be good kind of passing it between ourselves and with the disembodied uh, uh, Amy Stormer as well. Um, so it's gonna be a, a little bit free flowing here. I wanna uh, start by talking about, um, I just want you to look at these three messages, uh, really clear messages, uh, pretty obvious. This is a, uh, has to do not with nutrition, but with uh, tobacco use. Um, and all of these, uh, however, have had um, uh, been used for limited, with limited success uh, in the United States and, and elsewhere. Um, even though they're really clear, you can understand them, uh, and they have what seem like to be persuasive arguments. And then you look at this particular billboard, which is part of a larger campaign in the United States that was launched in the late 1990s. Um, and yet this is somehow uh, effective. Um, I'm not, there's no clear call to action. There's no, um, it's, it's a little bit uh, nuanced. Um, now as part of a larger campaign, it is attention grabbing, shock, it's funny, it's visual. So there are, those are all true. There, there might be some shame. There certainly is shame if you're that gentleman. Um, the humor. So I think it, it catches people, but uh, it, it kind of goes a little bit to me below the surface of that. So when you talk about not smoking, it's really the behavior among teenagers, and this was a campaign aimed at teenagers, it was rejecting a cigarette offered by a friend because not smoking is not a behavior. Not doing a behavior is not a behavior. And so when a teen is making this decision, we're telling them cigarettes are bad for you, but what world are they living in? They're living in a world where status, peer approval, independence, belonging, and respect, those are the things that are important. So. The idea of this campaign is they focused on what the teenager was shopping for, what people wanted, and it had a target behavior, um, a positive behavior that they wanted them to do. 
And standing in the middle of that, and this I think is the sort of the key piece here, and this was uh, very much part of the previous sessions, that the foundation of every effective message is making the right offer. You can do everything right, but if you're not making the right offer in behavior change, you're not gonna make a difference. And the link is what's the determinant of the behavior. And in this case, the determinant of the behavior is not about the risk uh, to your health uh, when you get older. That's not what the teenager is thinking about. They wanna be independent and cool and they want control. They care about social norms. They care about self standards. Uh, they wanna be themselves. And those, because the truth campaign, which is what that campaign was called uh, and is still around in the United States today, uh, more than a decade later, because they targeted the right, they were offering the right thing, the message was more effective. So the first rule and the most important rule about messages is that the intervention, what we do has to be effect, has to target the determinant, not just the behavior. So if I tell you, you should always pay attention to this uh, very exciting uh, webinar and never look away, you know, I'm doing something about the behavior, but I'm not really uh, affecting it. So let's look at this uh, piece right here. This is a billboard. And does anybody have a feel for, for what this uh, is about here? Let's actually go here and ask some questions here. So what's being offered here? What's the offer here? What's being offered here? Um, you know, it says uh, good health, fun, I guess. Yeah. Um, eating healthy, fun, nutrition. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I guess there's a little bit of, it's saying have fun. Um, it's not quite, I, I guess she's telling you to be active and eat right, whatever that is. And then you're supposed to go to the, my peer. Um, so what's the context for this? Who is it? Who do, who do you think it's aimed at? Kids? Yeah, it really must feel like it's a, the interesting thing is, you know what the context for this, you know where I saw this? I saw this and for those of you that have been to the United States and been on K Street in Washington, which is the, which is the street in the nation's capital that's full of all the lobbyists. Um, that's where this was, it was on. So I don't know if it was the best placement to reach kids, but it does feel like it reaches kids. And uh, it, it, we talked about who it's aimed at, it's aimed at kids. Um, do you understand it? Do you feel like you totally understand it? Everyone who likes the jungle book, someone said. Um, yeah, you sort of understand it, I guess. Um, I have trouble knowing exactly how I'm gonna do it other than if I go to the myperiod.gov. I don't know how many jungle book lovers um, are going to be going to mypyramid.gov. And, uh, and, and, and that seems to be what you're supposed to do. So uh, I, I use this because I think it's an example of where we go a lot, where we say, hey, we wanna make it fun for kids. We wanna make it look good. Then we put a billboard on uh, K Street. You know, maybe this was really about just showing people that we're, we're trying. And then we have a fairly sophisticated website we want people to go to um, uh, so it's, it's pretty hard to get to where you want to go. So I want you to think of your messages as a journey, as, um, you're going from, um, the offer, which is the foundation of everything to the frame in which it is. So the foundation, that's what people are shopping for. If you're not talking about what people are shopping for, what people are seeking, you're not going to be effective. You could be talking about what you think is important but they're not listening unless you're talking about what they think is important. Then there's the frame. Does this fit my worldview? Does it fit the way they're looking at the world? Okay, that's the next most important thing because people are trying to filter the messages out. We get millions of messages at us all the time and we're filtering them out. And people are expert about filtering because if we listen to every message, we never have any time to think. Is it the right place or context? Are you asking them to do something at a time that way away from when they're going to do it? And is it a context that matters for them thinking about the subject? Are you talking in the right tone? This is how we communicate. So people are listening to the tone and they're trying to figure out who you are and what you're doing. And anybody that's a parent on this call knows that tone is super important when you're talking to your teenager or any, any of your kids. Then there's, this is clarity. Now, notice just how far down the journey clarity is. Clarity is important, but it's not the first thing. And it's often the only thing we test for and the only thing we ask about. Is the message clear? But if a clear message about something people don't care about or in the wrong tone is still not going to be effective. And then finally, there's the call to action, what we call the CTA. Um, this is what we're asking people to do. 
It can be implicit or explicit. So sometimes you don't want an explicit call to action as, it, as you saw with the tobacco work. Because if you ask teenagers, don't, if you tell them don't smoke, automatically they're pushing it away. You, they need to come to it themselves. So sometimes your target, you have to let your target come to it themselves, but you do have to lead them there and you have to be conscious of what your call to action is. One of the things we saw on that last uh, billboard is, it, I, you know, yes, you're supposed to go to the website and you're supposed to eat right, but the call to action is pretty general. Um, when we talk about action and behavior change, it should be very specific. One of the things I tell my students is, if you are talking about, I want you to play lacrosse, that's different than I want you to, I want you to, to uh, pass. So remember, nothing is more important than the offer. And I want to talk about that, uh, talk about this. So here is a booster seat. These are seats that raise uh, children up so they don't get injured in a, in a crash or their injury wouldn't be as bad. Um, and we talk about, uh, you know, that this booster seat leaves your child at risk. No booster seat leaves your child at risk. But risk is a really tough behavioral determinant because there's a lot of competition around risk and there's also something called optimism bias. And, and everybody knows that you're more like, you don't have to be an invincible teenager to think that you're probably more likely that things are gonna be, come out well for you. This is optimism bias is what keeps the lotteries in business. So when we talk about safer C, yes, that's somewhat persuasive, but it's easily dismissed because I'm not gonna get in a crash in this particular trip. And most trips, people don't get in crashes. So just one word change, love seat. This makes it about a whole different determinant, a whole different offer. So booster seat is a way to show you care about your child. So you don't need to get in a crash. You automatically get the uh, benefit just by changing that word. So you use it and you get a reward. That's the offer piece. And I'm gonna pass it to uh, talk to, uh, and, 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 and Maraz is gonna give you a little bit of an idea of the program they're working on there and then tell you an example from uh, Bangladesh. Thanks, Peter. So before I start talking about um, my project and provide you some example, just to give you a little background where I work, I work for the project, uh, it's, a, it's called Sapling, Sustainable Agriculture and Production, linked to improved nutrition status, resilience, and gender equity. And we work in the southeastern part of Bangladesh, which is uh, home to a dozen of ethnic groups who have their uh, very diverse 12 different languages and very distinct culture from one another. So at the onset of the project, the problem we had that there is not much literature about them to know about the knowledge, attitude and practices or their socio-cultural norms. So we did a formative research at the beginning of the project and it was uh, with, um, it was in 26 different villages. Uh, we had hundreds of KII uh, in-depth interviews, key informant interviews, and almost 600 focus group discussions with 1,000 participants on WASH, food security, nutrition. One of the example I'm going to talk about, it uh, started on during COVID. So we all know that uh, it's very important to have, have some preventative, uh, take some preventative measures, especially respiratory hygiene practices like washing hand as much as you can. So we started uh, and in the context of Bandarbon, it's very remote and government and other bilateral organizations, local and um, INGOs have run a lot of mass campaigns on how to wash your hands properly. We had posters, we had announcement in Bangla, but one of the problem was that while most of the posters were somewhere that's in the catchment areas where people do not have access to during lockdown. So it's difficult how you're gonna reach them. And also most of them are non-literate and they don't speak Bangla. So how do you reach that entire section of population, at least half of them who uh, do not know the language and who cannot read. So we started running this wash with us campaign as a part of our program. So on your right, so what we did is like mm, taking ordinary people, like if you see the picture on your right, you'll see a grandmother and her granddaughter, five years old, 
while the grandmother is teaching her how to wash her hand in one of the prominent ethnic languages in Marma. The whole idea is most of the time we focus on the technicality so much that we uh, focus on wash your hands and all the steps, but it gives us a little different offer as Peter talked about that, okay, so it's someone from my family and they're washing hand and you can connect. And if you look on the left of the picture, uh, the woman who's making a tippy tap, which is very important in the context of Bandarbon because uh, one of the determinant why people do not wash their hand is the scarcity of water. So we also contacted the Chakma Circle Queen. So in this picture, the Chakma Circle Queen herself is making a tippy tap and with her son and showing how to wash hands to so make it a little more attractive to the audience. And we run those through social media and other platforms, and those were hugely successful. Hi, so this is Amy Stormer, and I just wanted to give an example. Um, in the Making Markets Work for Women project, which is a multi-sectoral agriculture and nutrition project in the Chittagong Hill Tracks region of Bangladesh, we were promoting hand washing and latrine use as a means of reducing diarrhea. And what we were finding was it wasn't very effective. So the team conducted a qualitative assessment to find out why it wasn't effective and found out that our participants knew that they when they should wash hands and they had the means to do so most of the time, but they felt that diarrhea amongst small children was normal and unconnected to health outcomes they really cared about, such as growth. So we changed our messaging to diarrhea isn't normal and it keeps your children from their full growth potential and hand washing and latrine use helps them to be happy, healthy and tall and also happy. Our offer was off because they weren't really concerned about diarrhea, but they were concerned about growth. So we didn't package the offer to change the behavior correctly. Um, and I just I wanted to show this slide so you could see kind of why they care about growth. This is a picture of me and some of our participants, and I'm 1.6 meters or five feet three and a half inches tall. And obviously our participants are not, um, and we're all wearing flat shoes. So you know they had aspirations for their kids to be taller and healthier and happier. And so this was actually a much more effective way of reaching them. So I want to talk about now about the idea of framing. And when we talk about framing, we're talking about what is the, uh, you know, like a frame. So there's something, what is, how do we surround it? How do we position uh, the message? Um, and what are we saying we're talking about? For you remember the tobacco example, are we talking about uh, your health? Or are we talking about uh, the manipulation that the tobacco industry does? To have you make a choice. Those are two different frames to look at the same behavior. We're going to go to another example from uh, Amy of that. Here I wanted to give a real world uh, nutrition example around framing. So in Cambodia with research that was conducted under our applied research on child health project, what we found was that women believed that breast milk substitutes had a better ability to make their children smarter because of the perception of modern technology and extra vitamins and minerals that were promoted as being part of the supplements and the fact that there were growing up milks that could transition their kids from birth all the way through to three years of age with different formulas. You know, so, so our participants were really revealing that their aspirations were around their kids' intelligence and they were willing to spend any available income on formula because it was deemed better than the method used by their mothers and their grandmothers, you know, traditional versus modern. And so our subsequent messaging in the projects had to really reframe how to promote breast milk and that it, it provided everything children needed and that the substitutes were incomplete copies of breast milk. So actually not providing their kids with as much smarts as what um, nature provided. And so I think we had to reframe the whole messaging um, for our participants based on the research that we had done. The next example we are going to do, which is uh, the core of our program, 
for sapling, which is the IEHFP or Integrated Enhanced Homestead Food Production. So it's um, dominantly female participant. We provide technical knowledge and also uh, having a patch of land in which they can practice the improved agricultural techniques, especially the use of safe usage of non-chemical organic pesticides and also other techniques. But the problem we faced constantly for three years after running this project that we see a very low uptake of use of mm, organic pesticide or fertilizer. And people kept using mm, chemical pesticide and fertilizer and we went back to them constantly and talk about the environmental impact uh, on the land and how it's going to affect the land and what we grow will not be good for health. But it failed to grab the attention of participants because what they have to say that mm, since the fellow period is now limited and there is a huge population pressure. We don't want to do it because it's really painstaking. And slowly we realized and we changed the frame of our messaging. Previously, we focused on the technical aspect and whenever we see this type of result, we try to reinforce the same messaging that focuses on the technical aspects. So then we shifted our gears and focused more about, okay, so this is a small patch of land. This is an endeavor that you take. And how about, yeah, it's difficult. It will be a lot more work, but how about if we grow it organically and it's for our family and our children, so they will have organic food, which is much better for their health. And we started seeing a little shift in the result. So um, now we're going to go on to uh, context. We did offer frame context. And when I talk about the context, it's where are they seeing this and how does that uh, relate to the behavior? So here's some, uh, some advertising in the United States um, done by the US, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, trying to get people, trying to encourage physical activity among kids. Um, so they say, hey, where are kids? Well, they're online, they're on the web. Uh, and then we're gonna tell them, hey, you should move a little bit every day as we reach them on the web as they're between gaming or whatever else they're doing um, and watching YouTube videos. Um, um, so that's, the web is where people are, but it's not where they're physically active and they don't have an opportunity to take advantage of this message. If they're convinced by this message, they're not in a place where they have the opportunity at the time necessarily to do it, unless you convince them to get away from their game or YouTube video. And anybody that has ever tried to get a teenager away from a game or YouTube video knows that that's not actually possible. Um, this is another campaign. This was in St. Petersburg, Florida in the United States, where uh, it was part of a, a campaign called Find the Fun and where this is a bus stop and at the bus stop, there are a bunch of locations in, near the bus stop that talk about physically active things you can do. And it's sold as fun things you can do with your family because that's what people were seeking. So it was an offer people wanted and it was given to them in the context they wanted. So the next example I would like to talk about is also regarding breast milk and like EBF, exclusive breastfeeding. So during the, uh, during the formative research we carried out and we talked specifically with the mothers, fathers, father-in-law and mother-in-law. And what finding we got was really interesting because when we talk about what you give your feed or feed your children after it's born, they, didn't, they don't usually talk about it, but we find out that there's a lot of prelectal that they you know, feed their children after is born. For example, bile of boa, alcohol, with many other things. And it has some connotation. And for example, if you give a little touch of bile of boa to the in, newborn, so all the impurities of their skin, it will disappear. And it's going to bring back the natural complexion of the skin. And it's kind of very interesting because uh, we in CHT or the region I work for, uh, mostly mother and father, they live separately in a nuclear family. So there was not supposed to be a much room for the mother-in-laws and father-in-laws in terms of decision-making. We found out that yes, mostly fathers 
are responsible and they take the decision based on their culture and social norms. But in terms of prelector, the mother-in-law and father-in-law or grandmother, they have, they believe that they have this better understanding about what to feed when they transition into the world. The way we actually find out is it's a tool that we have developed just to provide you an idea that we wanted to discuss about the food items they provide to their children. And so we specifically asked like about, okay, forget about food. What is it that you give when a child is born? And then we list down each and every single food item that participants talk about. And we then later on specific one by one, we discussed, okay, who decide that? Why it has been decided? And what, uh, who buy this? So all this information, when you get it, so you get the context right so that you can find out who your behavior or your message should be targeted to. So context. So context is often one of the biggest pitfalls uh, in international agriculture and nutrition projects and, and really in, in lots of projects writ large. I mean, even when formative research is done, the right offer is made, it's framed well. Sometimes the external environment makes adopting the behavior impossible. So this was an issue in, in one of our multi-sectoral projects implemented outside of Silet in Bangladesh, um, where health service seeking was heavily promoted for pregnant women to obtain their four antenatal care visits and to take their kids to monthly growth monitoring and promotion sessions that were happening at the nearest health facility, except they weren't. Uh, the services weren't always available when they were supposed to be. Staff were often away in the afternoons to pursue their own needs and their second careers. And so ch we had to change the messaging to go and seek the care first thing in the morning so that women knew that if they actually could get there, the services would be there. Um, and then... On the flip side, from the delivery perspective, we conducted a lot of advocacy with the Ministry of Health to make sure that the facilities would be available, that they would be stocked, and that they would be staffed. Um, in that same project, we had another contextual issue. Uh, we were advocating nutrition and health messages for 1,000-day moms, which is pregnancy to two-year period. Um, and group sessions. And even though we had been working in this area for several years, we just didn't realize that there were these significant class distinctions in this union, which was a very rural, very remote, very extreme poor community. But even within this group, those who were lower in status were afraid to attend for fear of repercussions. They didn't want to be seen as reaching above their station to be sitting with women of higher statue, stature. And so we had to have discussions with the village head who guaranteed that all women were welcome, uh, who actually attended several of the meetings so that everyone could see that this was something that he and his wife were really in favor of and promoting. Um, and then everyone was able to attend and hear the messages. Um, but the original context that, you know, frankly, we, we thought we knew made it impossible to adopt the behaviors. So I also just wanted to demonstrate a couple of our other SBCC pieces from, from this King's project in Myanmar. So um, one of the things that we were doing was working with Thousand Day Moms, um, trying to uh, help them kind of improve their pregnancy and birth outcomes. And so we would have group sessions and in the, we wanted to make them fun, but also informative. And so part of, part of what we would do would be to play games. And so on the left is a game that I think is probably very familiar to uh, at least American audiences of a certain age, uh, of which I am, uh, called Shoots and Ladders. And so um, essentially, you go through the game, and when you hit a good behavior, you climb up the ladder, and when you hit maybe a challenge, you come down the ladder. And so the whole thing is kind of trying to help your family get to where they want to be. Um, the other um, piece on the right is a poster, and in this poster, we're essentially showing um, 
all of the times that you should wash your hands. And then accompanying with a calendar for the year so that it's useful for the pregnant um, and lactating women for where you should be seeking health care services, your ANC, your uh, post antenatal care, and then your postnatal care. Um, so trying to provide useful things and also fun things for our participants. So now we've talked about the offer, the frame, what, how you're going to frame it, the context in which it happens. Now I want to talk a little bit about the tone of the message. So this idea is that your message carries more than information. We have a lot of attention on what benefits are we offering or what's the logic behind it. But we forget about this idea that about people's feelings and emotion. And if you look at commercial marketing, it's very much anchored in feelings and emotion. Uh, you can think about this a little bit as system one, system two, the idea that, that there's sort of gut reaction from um, things and then there's the thoughtful reaction. So what you, when you're doing tone, when you're thinking about the tone of your message, what you're actually communicating is again, should I filter this out or should I even listen to this? So now we're gonna hear a little bit from Amy, another part of the mother-in-law piece about where people's feelings were uh, coming into it. Another issue uh, in one of our other projects um, and as relates to tone, uh, came up in Nepal. So in, in a project area where HKI had been operating for several years, uh, 15 actually to be exact, uh, we had a lot of messages about pregnant and lactating women and their physical needs during this period of time. So needing a handful of extra food at every meal, the importance of rest, the importance of exclusive breastfeeding, i.e., no traditional supplemental foods like honey, which were, which were given often at the behest of relatives. And these messages were targeted at senior women and they were very, um, very focused on that target group, but also on that influence um, and, and the tone of which was to, you know, help your daughters and daughters-in-law to, um, to do these behaviors, to engage in these behaviors for themselves and also for their healthy babies. Uh, during this time, some newly collecting, collected demographic data showed that this, this whole change had shifted. And just in the period of a few years, uh, approximately 50% of households were not headed by senior household members, particularly senior women. Um, and so we were actually, our tone was, and our message was not hitting the right target and so we shifted the focus of messaging more to kind of the direct parents um, husbands and wives who were directly involved with with the pregnancy and child rearing so it was it was a very uh, big change and a surprising um, quick demographic shift so now I want to talk about um, uh, clarity and clarity is something that we do focus a lot on. So I don't want to spend much time on this is, is the message clear? Do people get it? But we got one ex more example from Amy. Hi, Amy here again with another real world example, uh, this time from Central America, where we were doing some work on a food security project. Uh, after the, the project had been essentially rolling out for several years, um, and it was a food security project, the messaging was heavily adopted from US social behavior change communication and involved promotion of, of a balanced diet. So eating a variety of foods in the right quantities um, would engender a, a healthy childhood. Um, unfortunately, when we did some focus groups around this, what we found was that the messages presented weren't clear. And so participants thought that the food had to be proportioned or balanced correctly, or the plate would actually tip over and their kids would not be able to eat the food. And so the message wasn't really about diversity or quantity. It was about making sure that plate stayed level and flat. Um, and that went on for several years until we changed the messaging around diversity and quantity, not so much around the actual plate. I want to talk finally about a call to action. And remember, I said a call to action doesn't have to be explicit. And you could see this in commercial advertising all the time. It doesn't have to be explicit, but it does. There does have to be a path to the action that is 
strong, it has implicit enough or it's clear enough that you're going to get them there. And when it's an explicit message, you have to think about all those other things to uh, play it out. So I want to do this quick example from the United States uh, aimed at getting uh, high school, uh, so, so secondary school, the uh, older secondary school students not to drink uh, alcohol. And um, instead of it being part of a message about don't drink alcohol, it was a part of a science um, lesson in how your brain works and what helps your brain. And part of that was alcohol. So because that message was embedded, it had more credibility. And we could talk about specific calls to action explicitly without feeling like we're lecturing an adolescent, which is always a, a problem. Now, I wanna talk uh, quickly about pretesting. Um, this is uh, an important thing that uh, we do to make sure our messages come across well. And this is the idea that you're gonna show it to a group of people like the target audience before you actually launch the message so you could find all these problems in advance and correct for them. The problem with pretesting, in my view, is that we're very focused on the rational part of how people react to messages. And we under uh, um, estimate the power of the emotional and the engagement pieces. And the way we've gotten around that is to test for all three of these segments. The first segment are uh, questions about whether they like something, whether they understand it, what's it saying, um, what's new information is a very important question on the rational side. And then the idea of the emotional piece is we give a bunch of adjectives and people check off those adjectives and based on the adjectives that they check off, we know a little bit about where it is. Also within those adjectives are some other ones that aren't shown here that tell us whether it is a positive engagement, a negative engagement, an active engagement or a passive engagement. Passive engagement is a killer. It means basically that your background music and you don't want to be that. You want to be in front. You want to be uh, looking at them. So let's look at some. These are some concepts that we did for um, aimed at seniors in the United States to get them to think about uh, Medicare, which is the program that covers, provides health insurance for Americans over 65. Uh, part of that doesn't include dental. So your teeth are not covered. One part of your your body is not covered. And this is trying to convince people that it should be to be politically active. And so Here's some concepts that says uh, Medicare should look like this, has a teeth in a, in a, uh, uh, a glass. Uh, there's there's a, um, some other ones. Uh, Medicare wants to uh, uh, fire your dentist, uh, sort of loss aversion uh, approach. And what we found here, besides the rational piece, was it was, it was active and it was negative. So that was one kind of reaction. You could see the different emotional reactions. Here's another one that talked about uh, getting what you paid for because you contribute into Medicare through your life uh, if, you're, if you're working. And we looked at the rational pieces, but again, you can see emotionally, this was some different emotional reactions, but it was a positive active engagement, which is the, which is the quadrant that is uh, often the most powerful, although negative active can be powerful as well in certain circumstances. And then here's one where people had a lot of you know, good emotions, anticipation, joy, trend, you're going, oh, wow, this one's really going to do well, but it was passive, it was positive passives. So again, they like these ads, they're not going to make any difference. Um, they're not really engaged in them um, very much. So the main concept here is you're going to want to test rational pieces, emotional pieces, and engagement. So let's talk about how you're going to use this in the real world. And uh, we're gonna start with an example from Ross. So I, I would like you all to look at the picture, uh, the first picture. So this is something that our project was promoting to how to make an ideal chicken coop because our project decided to provide two hand to all the pregnant lactating women with hope that they will uh, have those chickens get egg and have some animal source protein, especially egg for their children and themselves. So if you look at the previous picture, what we found out that uh, chicken coop like this, and in order to make it, 
it's very expensive. It's gonna cost uh, around $50, $60. And what we, are, we were providing participants, our beneficiaries is just like two chicken. And we were teaching them about building a chicken shed or coop for themselves, which is gonna cost them around uh, $50. In terms of what we have been discussing since in this webinar, you'll see that that's something that people won't be able to do. And we didn't pay any attention to that. And later on, when we go back to the communities and we constantly find out that they're not interested and we actually lost their attention because that's not realistic for them. And then we went back and we found out, okay, so what's wrong with a traditional chicken coop that they have? If it's safe, and if you can keep it clean, and if the chicken shed can provide chicken security from different disasters and praise, it's fine as long as you keep it clean. So we, we actually changed the messaging around it. And then the next problem was, it's kind of very interesting because we went, we were very emotionally carried out and we wanted to talk about how important it is to grow your own chicken, taking care of them. And we talked about hatching pot and why it's important to keep the chicken, the broody hen separated after one week from the uh, baby chicks. And our messages were um, like you care for your child, the chicken also need, the hen need care for its children. So you have to ensure that everything is in place. And during our video production, we went to Reiki the area and we found out that the participants took it seriously and they find it's an absolute sin to separate hen, mother from the baby chicks and they're not gonna do it anymore. And this is our messaging because we wanted them to take care of their poultry birds. And then we had to shift a little from that. I want to give you a simple way to apply this. And, uh, you know, nothing is, is simpler than a top 10 list. So this is a checklist of things to think about um, as you're designing your messages and evaluating them because you want to go through that editing process. So does it influence or um, access a key determinant? So does it get, does it offer something that people are shopping for and does it address a determinant of the behavior or are you just talking about the behavior? Is it relevant to the need states, what people need or their aspirations, what people want? Remember, people are trying to fill their needs and their wants and if you're not addressing that, then you're filtered out. Is it framed and anchored for action? You know, what, what, how, have you anchored this message in their real life? And we've heard a bunch of examples about how we had some, you know, what we thought were pretty good messages, but they weren't anchored in the real life of people. A clear call to action, explicit or implicit. It does not need to be an explicit call to action every time. It depends on the behavior. Does it recognize the context of the communication channel? Where are they getting the message? How are they getting the message? And is that a place where they can act? And how does that fit in to where they are? So we often talk about the stages of change as a way to segment people The you know, where are people along? Are they pre-contemplation, contemplation? Are they uh, thinking about the behavior? Are they planning to do the behavior? Are they actually doing the behavior as a way to segment? You also wanna think of what stage are they in when they get the message? Where are they when they get the message? And, and what time is it? You know, is it the right time? So you really wanna be thinking about that. You gotta uh, recognize the, con the actor's context. In other words, what is their world like? When and where the actor will get the message? We talked about that. The tone must match with the source message and audience. The tone says something about the source, who you are. The tone says something about the message, how valid is it? And the tone says something about who's supposed to listen. And just getting the tone right, you can eliminate your audience. Of course, there's a the clear, concise, and fit with literacy. And a great rule of thumb is, less words. I don't care if you're talking to PhDs, the, you, the power of visuals is always gonna be more powerful. And very often we're talking to people with uh, lower literacy, but it's, it's, it's actually true of everyone. So the maximum use of visuals and emotion, emotion communicates something. We talked about pre-testing. These are some pre-testing questions you can ask. Uh, what is the main thing this is trying to tell you? What do you like or dislike and why? Why is of course very important. This is qualitative uh, pre-testing. 
is there any new information here? And what is it? Uh, we just recently did uh, a piece of uh, work uh, about uh, uh, safety, rail safety, and uh, we had to go back and look at what do people not know? Everybody knows that if you get hit by a train, it's not a good thing. We don't have to explain that. But people don't know it takes a mile for a train to stop. That's a piece of new information. What here might be helpful to someone like you? You know, what, you know, so you're asking them, this is another question about pretest question, and which words would you associate with these messages? And that's that whole idea of all the adjectives. So one of the things that I just wanted to highlight is the, the issue around multi-sectoral programs. Um, and just kind of provide some food for thought. I mean, I think one of the things that that I've certainly noticed over the last 10 years is that the complexity of nutrition and agriculture projects has grown as the, as the connection between nutrition sensitive agriculture and nutrition specific behaviors is, has become more well established. But consequently, so too has the messaging. And so many of these projects have messages about water, sanitation and hygiene, livestock health, climate smart agriculture technologies, livelihoods, maternal and child health, nutrition, gender and social integration. Uh, and so one of the questions is, are, are we making our participants try to absorb too much information? Are we expecting too much of them to be able to not just understand, but also adopt all of these behaviors in all of these different realms. You know, it, is this like asking them to take a drink of water through a fire hose that's just kind of flowing at them? So the Suahara project, which is a USAID fund, funded project uh, in Nepal, uh, currently operating at about half of, in half of the country, um, has really thought a lot about this. And as you can see, this this is uh, the results framework um, in a very simplified way. And you can see that, you know, the goal is improved nutrition status of women and children under two. And then look at all of the different things that are going on in that project, right? So you've got improved household nutrition, increased use of quality nutrition and health services, improved access to diverse and nutrient-rich foods, accelerated rollout of the government's multi-sectoral nutrition plan through local governance, gender equality and social inclusion, social behavior change, emergency preparedness, public-private partnerships. Um, so I think there's there's a lot going on in these projects, and so it, it may be a lot to ask to push messages, multiple messages in all of these realms. In consequence to that, what Suahara has decided to do is essentially to keep it as simple as possible. And so they've come up with 10 key behaviors. And these are the messages that are promoted with the population in the Suahara project. So dietary diversity for women, particularly eating more eggs and meat, attending ANC at least four times, taking all 180 iron folic acid tablets during pregnancy, using a modern form of family planning, dietary diversity for children, particularly focused around more animal source foods and iron rich foods because our research from previous projects had shown that that was a problem. Um, Feeding the child more or the same during an illness. Our, a lot of our formative research was showing that children weren't eating or parents weren't feeding children as much because there was a belief that you needed to starve the fever. Um, to give ORS, oral rehydration therapy, and zinc to children with diarrhea. To wash hands at six critical times. And to give the child under six months only breast milk. Oh, and to treat drinking water at home. And so those those are kind of the 10 key things that they're focusing on. And the and the messages are really um, short and simple and and hopefully understandable by the population groups. I just wanted to wrap up in New Orleans style with what we call a little lanyap. And lanyap is something that's a little bit extra. So you get a little bit extra when you go to the store and the owner of the store knows your mama, for example. So. This little bit extra is something that 
we've been thinking about a lot at Helen Keller International. And you know, one, one of the biggest messages, I think, from all of our examples, it's very clear, is do the formative research. Even when you think you know, even when you've been there for years, because things change, even when you're literally looking right at them, things change and you don't see it. But, and this is a big but, this takes time and effort and resources. But it's really crucial to get it right the first go around so we're not scrambling after we've tried something that, that didn't work. So if you can, and this is a message out there for donors too, don't think you're off the hook, devote the first year of a multi-year project to setting it up the right way. You know, and, and this isn't a luxury. That year will be full of activities. You know, do the household census. Find out about your potential communities, not just about your participants and their households, but also where are the health facilities? When are they open? How far are they? Where are the water points for your community? Do they all work? Who are the key influencers in a community that you need helping you promote your messages? Staff up your project with, with local resources, local people who speak the language, who know the customs and the issues that, that you want to change. And that sounds very obvious, but what we find, particularly in a lot of projects that are rural and remote, is that it's difficult to get staff to want to go there and stay there. Everybody likes living in the capital city. So really to invest that time in doing the capacity development of local staff um, and, and helping them, you know, training them well so that they can then deliver well. You know, conduct your research and use it. You know, so often, even when you've done your formative research, there's just too much time pressure and time crunch to use it effectively um, to create the messaging and then to test that messaging. So not just for understandability, but also for effectiveness, right? Because piloting doesn't just mean pre-testing. Piloting means testing the messages for impact. And so these are just some of the things that, that we have been thinking about and, and frankly asking for with some of our, our larger longer term projects because what we've realized is, is to do it right, you really need to have that time to do the research and plan and hire and train. So that's my little land yap. So uh, there you go. Uh, that's sort of the, the, the presentation with the land yap. And I love that we're now having a, a Nigerian and how so uh, uh, different uh, uh, terms for, this, for that same thing. So uh, I'm gonna bring that back to Amy because she needs to expand her vocabulary in, uh, around the world. Um, I'm hoping this is helpful. Uh, I think we're going now to uh, some questions. Thank you so much for uh, a very insightful presentation. Um, yeah, I really like uh, at the beginning you said, you know, like I do not do this is not a behavior that we want to promote. I think I've heard this for children, you know, if you tell the, ch the child don't do this, then they're thinking <laughs> about doing exactly that. Um, yeah, and just thinking about how to make the right offer. So we have a lot of uh, really good questions from uh, the audience. So I'm going to start. Um, so our first question is from uh, Rebecca Oser, and it says, can you talk about how you conduct an analysis that identifies what the barriers are to practicing the behavior? If you're pushing the use of car seats and change the name to love seat, if the issue is cost, then renaming the seat is not going to achieve the change you want. Absolutely. And I was using that example as two different. And in fact, uh, one of the things we found, and it depends very much on context, one of the uh, best known um, of the uh, child safety seat uh, issues is in Mexico, where they were giving it away free and people still weren't using it. And then they had the Catholic priest bless them as uh, these seats. And then that uh, ended up helping. Again, it was about the emotional and the connection piece that was so important. Um, and how do you figure it out? Well, you ask uh, some simple questions. There's six questions that we ask all the time that are really important to ask. Um, what are the good things that happen when you blank? What are the bad things that happen when you blank? 
um, what makes doing blank easier, what would make it hard, what, what, what uh, I'm sorry, what makes it difficult to do blank, what would make it easier to do blank, who cares if you do blank, um, and why. Um, those are some, 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 those questions are, are uh, super helpful. Um, uh, who doesn't want you to do blank? So you're kind of going to get at some of the behavioral determinants. There's a, uh, we can pr provide it after the, uh, this, this, we have a six pager on questions to ask to get to the idea of what is the determinant of the behavior, which is mm -hmm. the foundation on which your message is, is built. And um, we can get past that along. Yeah. Well, the next question is kind of similar, still talking about the how to, um, you know, have an effective message. Ram Tresta asks, how do you decide what to what to offer when the usual offers, for example, such as health, better health and better nutrition are not clear or not working? So that is a great question. And that to me is you go to what people are shopping for. What are people needing? What are people wanting? So look at the example of the, I, I use smoking because it's really simple behavior. It's a lot simple. It's a lot simpler to work on smoking than to work on agriculture and nutrition. Um, so, because uh, there's a lot more complications involved. But smoking is very simple. It's a very simple behavior. And what we did is we looked at what are uh, uh, they, they looking for? What are they getting out of cigarettes? They're, they're, yes, they're getting the nicotine high, but they're also getting a feeling of independence and a way to tell their parents that they're adults and they get to make their choice, which is why we couldn't have an explicit call to action, don't smoke, from, coming from us. So uh, we just had to change the context and give them that independence. So when the health message or the message about the rational piece isn't there, think about what people are shopping for, what people are looking for, what your target audience wants, and then figure out how you can provide that and in the uh, process, get them to do your behavior. So you're gonna, you wanna, sometimes you have to marry your behavior to a want that doesn't necessarily fit because you don't necessarily get that, you don't get to be cool just because you refused a cigarette, but we tried to make those things closer for uh, teenagers. Thank you, Peter. And I have a question for Miraz um, and, uh, this is about, this is a um, kind of a specific question, but also I think overall, just the question on context. What type of communication materials do you recommend to use when there is high illiteracy and people have limited access to internet? Okay, so th that's also a great question. And the work we conduct, it's uh, mostly with people who are non-literate and not only limited internet, so I would say it has to be a lot more visual. If we can, or if we can use our behavior change agents or our um, frontline staff, I would recommend using a lot more DIY style videos and not only focus on the technology part, but also focus on the different pros and cons of the behavior we try to promote. And yes, a lot of posters and videos. We have someone who has uh, his hand raised, Peter Goebbels. I don't know if you're ready um, to ask your question or provide a brief comment. I can unmute you. Thank you, Cecilia. This is Peter Goebbels, uh, based in Ghana, working with Groundswell. I have a question for Peter. Um, most of the social behavior change that you've talked about and the approach seems to be oriented towards individual behavior change around improved health, improved nutrition, um, chicken raising, and so on. My work is more involved with um, advocacy work for rural communities and maybe organizational change, maybe a farmer's organizations to advocate for policies at the local government level, for example or engage in wider alliances for changes that will improve their uh, situation in terms of agriculture or health or water supply. I was just wondering to what extent do you have experience with this and to what extent is the framework that you outlined maybe applicable also to changing behaviors to motivate people to engage in processes to, to work with networks to, to advocate for changes. 
uh, even at the local governmental level. Great. So the same uh, rules apply. Um, and we do a lot of advocacy work. Uh, and the advocacy issue is um, one way to think about it. We say connect, counsel, convert. So we often start, we try to do convert first. We just hop to, you should do this. And this is the reason we think you should do this. But we don't connect with the audience. And a great example, uh, we're in the middle of political season. People are actually voting here in the United States for, you may have heard about this election. Um, and uh, uh, that connection uh, uh, was, uh, uh, wasn't there um, for uh, the Democrats in 2016, for example, with uh, segments of the population because they never connected with them. They weren't, they didn't go first to the idea that um, we're gonna talk about things in your context, we're gonna talk in your tone, we're going to recognize where you're coming from. Um, and so the idea, we actually call it ally acquisition, which is the idea of that we're often talking to the segment of, you know, in the United States, it's called to motivate the base. You're talking to the base. Um, and, and we're often doing that and we're not expanding uh, our audience um, or maybe even turning off our audience. And that's a, in, in elections, that's an electoral stat strategy. In advocacy, I think it's, it's the death knell of programs, especially uh, I've seen this a lot in environmental programs that come out from the front end and talk to the agricultural sector, for example, in a way that uh, the agricultural sector recognizes that as you don't understand my life. You don't get where I'm coming from. So if you just do something to start out where the only thing you're doing is getting that connection, you're just, just one step at a time, you're gonna get further along. So, you know, I grew up in a, in a very rural area um, and, and worked on farms in uh, actually in, in, in France in, in, in high school. And it, it uh, you know, we used to say that, you know, people from the city think eggs come from supermarkets. And that is the kind of feeling you can get. And, 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 and Maras had the great example of the chicken coop where we're saying, hey, you can construct this great thing. Here's two chickens. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't connect well. And um, it could have been, um, you know, and then, and, then, and then we often are correcting ourselves later. And when we don't come out, this goes to Amy's point about the formative research first. When we come out wrong out of the front end, we're recovering that forever. And, and, and again, to use the political sphere, uh, you know, the Democrats are still coming back from their 216 election where they basically lost a whole segment of the population. Um, but we'll see how that turns out in a, in a, you know, some of you may notice what happened, we'll see. So, um, thank you. This next question is similar to the, the question that was just asked, but I think just maybe to expound on that, I love if each of you can uh, respond maybe from your contextual points of view, because my, I've seen in, I've been hearing messages, even here in the US, for example, with uh, the issue of uh, abuse of drugs. And, and I've noticed that uh, the messages, sometimes we talk about like, you know, changing things at a population level, and then others are talking about like at a very individual level. And I wonder how the context really affects uh, this idea of individualism versus, versus community and what you all think about this. So here's the, a question from Robin Rothweiler says, could we drop most of the rational part in campaigning, uh, for example, rational knowledge on good nutrition and be especially populistic, emotional with messaging in order to be successful? I would say both are really important. You, it's all about like when you talk about context, framing, CTA, to CTA. So when you, you see the entire thing, how a message works, you have to look for the rationale, but it sh should not only come from us. It also, you have to, why we need the formative research because you need the nuanced understanding of the beneficiaries and the participant. So you have to understand their rationale and their aspiration and the other emotional aspect in order to do the messaging. 
So uh, for me, from my personal experience, yeah, both are kind of important. And if you get the emotional wrong, you can't get through to do the rational piece. Um, and that, and that, that's, and it, it just, it just matters to me if we just in our work, uh, in the work that I've done, uh, USAID projects and so on, um, I find that that it's really hard for people. It's really hard sometimes for f funders to get that uh, idea that uh, this is not necessarily entirely a rational decision. Um, and yet look at all of us. All of us are not completely rational beings. And, you know, uh, Cecilia brought up the idea of this idea of community versus individual and how people in different uh, cultures will uh, react to that. Uh, we recently did some testing uh, on messages about dementia among uh, the Latino audience in the United States and the African American audience. Completely different reactions. So in Latino, everything's very family oriented. Uh, generally, and um, although Latino is a pretty diverse audience in and of itself, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, and then the African American population, it was more about, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of the group and more kind of political community versus family community. So even the idea of community is different among people. Um, and this is why we segment and have uh, different audiences and so on. Here's a question for Miraz uh, from uh, Shibani. Uh, the question is how to tackle social desirability bias in pre-testing of SBCC messages. In terms of um, social desirability bias and how to avoid it, I would say it's very important, first of all, before you go with a particular messaging, have a uh, talk with the participant, especially your beneficiaries uh, in the context of to see what they actually feel about it, uh, uh, discuss and brought up this topic and the six question that Peter asked about and just talk about it and find out what's, where their aspiration lies, what's the context and how they feel about that particular issue before you just go ahead and preach the messaging to them and see how you feel about it. And I think like Peter might be able to expand on that a little? Yeah, so that's, I was hoping, I was really glad that you addressed that question to Maraz because that's a really tough thing. And I think all the tough questions should go to him as my own personal feeling. But the, uh, uh, I think that um, it's, it's, you have to take it into account that it's there. So you try to avoid it, but you have to have the caveat that it's there and recognize that people are giving you answers. So one of the things that we do is, um, kind of uh, let, give people permission to give a socially undesirable answer by framing the question in a different way. An example of this, uh, again, I'm sorry, from the United States, is when we try to uh, measure racism, which is a very difficult thing to, to measure because obviously, I can say obviously, I hope obviously it's wrong. Um, and uh, what we measure is, uh, one of the questions we ask is, do you think that uh, white people have it especially difficult in the United States? And that answering affirmatively to that is an indication that you may um, have uh, racial beliefs that are uh, not, uh, they're more likely to be racist. Uh, but we don't ask you, are you a racist? Because then you're going to get, you know, no one's going to answer yes. Um, so a lot of it is how you frame the question. The other thing is uh, just, you know, obviously who's asking the questions and how you involve people that uh, look like. We recently did something uh, at AU, which is where I, I, I'm an instructor, American University. Um, we did some work where uh, we had a, a white student interviewing other white students and an African-American student in interviewing other African-Americans. And it was interesting, the conversation, the way, and I wonder if we had changed moderators, how the conversation would have been different. So those are just two pieces, but the main thing is recognize that caveat and know as you're, as you're looking into the results that exists. So we have uh, someone, uh, Nilofar Sheik, who has a question is willing to, to ask it verbally. Thank you, Cecilia. I have a question for Amy. Um, and, and that is that any suggestions about 
addressing the issues of taboos among influencers when talking to mothers about dietary diversity, because uh, in Myanmar, we notice that there's a lot of taboos, you know, what to eat, what not to eat during pregnancy and lactation. And, uh, and something that, you know, like how to address that when you are giving your messages to mothers or when you're talking to them. That's a great question, Jennifer. So this is a particular pressing issue and we struggle with it a lot, especially when it comes to taboo, it automatically means it's also not something people usually com feel comfortable to talk about. When, when we discuss about a particular food taboo or dietary diversity taboo, and we found a lot in terms of uh, during for a uh, pregnant mother to a lactating mother for this phase and for their infant, there is a lot of uh, belief and taboo and it's really hard to get around all this and have a discussion with the entire group of participants. So first of all, the one thing that we, we have established as we separate the groups in order to understand uh, where, what, where those are coming from and allowing them, allowing your beneficiary to express themselves. And yes, it can, can be a, uh, you have to very actively listen to what your participants has to say and try to be as non-judgmental as possible and see when you are framing your SBCs, for example, that there's a particular taboo for mothers to eat meat for last three months of their pregnancy in a few communities, because if they do so, then the weight and size of the baby will increase and it's gonna be a difficult birth. So every taboo, it has some sort of connotation, social connotation and denotation. So if we can get to that point when we know that why it became uh, aspirational or a particular social norm for the community, we can actually try to address it through our messaging by make it more connected and frame those messages that uh, circulate around the taboo. We also have uh, Imgard Im Jordan, who has her hand raised. Would you like to? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering on two sides. Um, one is, um, how do we address the gender issue in all this messaging? Most of the examples you have been given were addressed to women, but when we would like to convince men to participate in household choruses, this becomes a very tricky um, area of talking. And, and especially when we talk in um, on English, it seems to be simple for us, but when we have to translate this to local languages and local storytelling, how can we ensure that within the translation process, we don't miss the point um, and all the criteria you have been listing um, because just cross translation um, will not help us there. Um, maybe you have some experience that would be great to hear from that. So the, the translation point, and I like your word storytelling of the other um, of, of the of the other language because it's it's not about the words tra it's the translation so much gets lost in translation. So we one of the things we do here is when we're doing a Spanish language campaign, it's a separate campaign. It's not we don't translate the English into Spanish. We have some conceptual things we might. Uh, have an, 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 an a creative brief that might be the same, but then we have a different creative team working on that. And sometimes what comes out of the Spanish creative team can be used in what we call in the United States, the general market. But, uh, um, but I think the idea there is to really think about if you're going, uh, depending on what the, if there's a lot of cultural pieces there of just thinking about that as you, you can't just translate. Uh, and I know that's, uh, you know, there's cost and, and, and issues with that, but you can, what you can do is you can think about we're you're dealing with this now with um, uh, a, a number of Asian languages that we're working on with uh, another campaign. And uh, what we've done is we've convinced the, uh, the, 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 the funder that uh, we're, let's work on, let's do these cultures well, rather than say, we're gonna just do one Asian campaign, because everybody knows Asia is all the same, right? You know, of course, nah. Um, Asia, you know, let's just do this group and do it well, rather than try to make it big and not do it well. I think it's so important to, your, your question is right. And there's no way around it. There's no, I don't have a trick that says, oh, if you use this translation dictionary, it works better. There's no way around it. And if you think you're doing it, 
just by doing the translation, you're just fooling yourself. So we often use the term is gender is cross-cutting and we don't fully understand it. And you're right that as most of our messaging are targeted to female participants or uh, women, so whether we are actually putting more emphasis and are we considering their workload? Can societies be changed with just focusing on women? And that was the particular feedback that we received during our midterm evaluation that we focus too much on women. So what happened to the other section of population? So yeah, you're right. You have there has to be a balance. So there are preconditions and there are strategic needs that requires the entire population, especially the male part, to um, be involved and get engaged. And that's a tricky part when you have to figure out what's, uh, when we design any sort of intervention, we have to ask a particular question that's what's in it for me. So in terms of women, so we can uh, say that, yeah, that's the project, we're providing them technical knowledge. So how to engage men in it? Because when it, what's in it for them? Why would they engage? So find that right balance, what you can offer to them so that you can make uh, make them interested in your project and participate in a way that makes a great change. So that's one of the way you address gender. It's not only focusing on women, but also starting a conversation that discuss around their issue. And in terms of translation, we had this great problem whilst at the beginning of the project because we had to translate like 10,000 questions in 12 different languages. So how do you do that? You simply don't do that. You do not do verbatim translation. That's out of the question. You just uh, try to find the crux of the question and what you need to translate and put your own wording because we, ha we have to run a particular session in 10 different languages. So we try to uh, recruit locally and go through the series of training and find out whether that person have understood it and got the entire idea and let them do their own translation with their own community. And there is where I see as challenge for us because then we may lose the opportunity to ensure the quality and to correct the quality right. So we may actually change the message you wanted to aim at. Um, and we, we aimed it and then um, we have no, how to say, no communal understanding about the context. And that, that is where I see a big challenge which you haven't solved yet. I do want to, I want to follow up with a question from the chat box and then I'll have the last two questions from the two people who are raising their hand. Um, maybe I would say perhaps answer these in the, within the same uh, framework of thinking, maybe in, in the example of engaging men. Uh, so Nuru Liawati Nui, how can we know that people um, are engaged with our messages? And a similar question from Christina Granger, would you I would love to learn how to measure engagement in your in your pre-testing. I would guess if asking things like what do you, what do you do after reading or hearing these or something to that effect. Just like if you ask people why do you do something, they'll you the, a lot of the answers you'll get are actually not true. So we have behaviors and we can explain all our behaviors, but our explanation might not match the real reason why our behaviors are. And the same thing goes with engagement. So for engagement, we uh, we have uh, based on the adjectives they use and whether those are more passive or active uh, or, uh, or more negative or positive, uh, they associate with the message, uh, then we uh, code those and match it against, uh, and we found that to be, you know, the, the best method to do that because, um, you know, it's just like if you show somebody a message and say, will this change your behavior, you're never going to get you know, the right answer. Or if you ask somebody about social norms, according to all focus groups I've ever seen, social norms don't exist for those individual people. Like we're all, none of us are influenced by our peers, which is, you know, not actually true. So the last question uh, for you two from P Peter Schmidt. You two have together some 30 years of experience with designing SBC messages and materials. Uh, what are your key lessons learned related to designing good SBC messages and materials? I'll use, I have one very simple thing. Think in terms of the audience, step into their world. It's about, it's really about them. It's not even about the behavior, it's about them. It's certainly not about you. 
Very well said, Peter. I would I would say the same thing. When you are engaged in terms of what's a good message, you have to try to put their shoes on and see if you are from that community, whether this is something that's achievable, this is something that you desire to do, and this is something remotely realistic for you to even consider doing. And then you will know that whether the messaging that we always preach for and we want people to adopt, how, how realistic it is for your participants and that's how you find out and always actively listen to what people have to say. Thank you. Thank you both. And, and also please thank Amy for her contribution. Thank you so much, everyone, for your great questions, participation throughout. Uh, there are also, we had some questions about materials and manuals. There were some links shared. You can uh, find uh, the GIZ manual uh, available in the, the ANH Academy website resources for this uh, webinar series. So with that, we, uh, we conclude. Again, thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.